All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Cape Perpetua Speaker Series. Today, we're going to be hearing from Bruce Byers on the view from Cascade Head Lessons for the Biosphere from the Oregon Coast. And next week, uh, our presentation will be on valuing water, learning from the past to add resilience to our, fe our future. And a little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Dubois, and I'm the communications coordinator for the collaborative. And our vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, and awareness, and stewardship from the land and the sea in and around the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. Uh, we were founded about three, three and a half years ago, and we have a variety of partners, including federal agencies, state agencies, local nonprofits, as well as the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians. Our focus is around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. It's Oregon's largest marine reserve. And in addition to the marine protected areas, there's protected waters between uh, Yahats and Florence. And today's fun fact is um, I wanted to share just kind of all the abundance of the area. Um, so this stretch between Yahats and Florence um, encompasses many uh, uh, significant locations, including the Cape Perpetual Moon Reserve and protected areas, numerous state parks, um, Audubon's 10 Mile Creek Sanctuary, the Sayus Law National Forest, the Cape Perpetua Scenic Area, uh, two wilderness areas, uh, Rock Creek and Cummins Creek, a globally significant important bird area, uh, the Oregon Islands National Refuge, Oregon's Ocean Shore State Recreation Area, natural resources that provide habitats for migratory and resident seabirds, marine mammals, native fish and wildlife, cultural resources, as well as many of you may already know, places for people to recreate. It's just such a special place and I'm always just feel so fortunate to be able to work in and around it. And we also host a variety of community science um, in the area. Uh, some of it is seasonal, some of it is monthly. Um, and uh, on every month, in addition to the Cape Perpetual Speaker Series, we host a Young Scientist webinar series and that's the second Tuesday evening of the month of every month, October through April. And you can find out all of the information on the events that we host and our presentations that we host on our website at capeperpetualcollaborative.org. Um, and just click on the events tab and that'll take you to our calendar. I do encourage you to connect with us on our Facebook page at Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And we've just started a YouTube page about uh, six months ago, uh, Cape Perpetual Collaborative, where we are hosting uh, all of our recordings from these presentations that we've been doing. Uh, so if you've missed any and you'd like to go back and uh, review them, they are available for you on our YouTube channel. And with that, I'd like to introduce Bruce Byers. He is an ecologist, writer, and consultant. His book of essays about the Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve the View from Cascade Head, Lessons for the Biosphere from the Oregon Coast was published by the Oregon State University Press in October 2020. Bruce has advised government agencies and NGOs around the world on biodiversity, conservation, and ecosystem management, and has worked in 34 biospheres reserves in 17 countries. He was the resident ecologist at the Sika Center for Art and Ecology at Cascade Head in 2018, and a visiting scholar at the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest in the Oregon Cascades in October of 2019. And with that, I am going to stop share my screen. Bruce, you can go ahead and bring your uh, share screen up. And while Bruce is bringing his screen up, I just wanna let you know that we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, so feel free as questions become available that you can just plug them right into the Q&A box. Um, and you may see Bruce pop on every now and then. Um, his camera was giving him some difficulties, so he may have that off at times as well. So he may come and go. But fortunately, we still have his sound so we can hear him to learn from. 
And Bruce, from there, um, you are welcome to take it over. Okay, I think I turned on my, are you seeing my screen, Tara, or not? No, we're not. There we go. Yes, now. We are seeing it, but we're not seeing your PowerPoint. We're seeing a library window. Okay, I don't see how I get back to my screen sharing. Here we go, let's try this. Perfect. Okay, and is that going to full screen? There we go. It is, we do see it in full screen now. Okay, and I will try, let's see if I can try the video. Um, I am not sure I see where to try the video. Let's see. Well, I think I better just launch ahead with no, um, no video here, if that's okay. And uh, you'll have to imagine my Zoom studio started <laughs> having a problem with this webcam just this morning. Uh, Tara and I tested this during the week and it looked fine. But um, anyway, thank you, Tara, for that introduction. And thanks very much to the Cape Perpetual Collaborative for hosting this event. Um, thank you all for coming virtually to join this. And um, in these very strange times we're experiencing, I hope you're all staying healthy and hopeful and getting out into the beautiful nature wherever you are. I want to start also here. Uh, the cover of this book has a beautiful photo of the outer point, the pinnacle of Cascade Head taken by from a drone uh, by Duncan Berry, who's a longtime resident of Cascade Head. And he was kind enough to share that drone photo with me for the cover. So I think it's a beautiful cover. Thank you, Duncan. <clears throat> and um, I also want to thank the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. Tara mentioned that they sponsored me as their Howard L. McKee Ecology resident for four months starting in October of 2018. And also to the McKee family, which provided the support for that particular ecology focused residency. I think I wanna say just a little more about how I uh, came to write this book and, um, and how I yeah, got into it in the first place. Give you a little bit more background. I uh, am a ecologist and after my PhD, I taught at the University of Colorado in Boulder for about 10 years before moving to Washington DC to pursue some interests in um, applied ecology and biodiversity conservation and international development. And for the last 25 years, I've been working partly internationally, partly domestically as an independent ecological consultant. But I love to write and I love to read. And so about 10 years ago, I started a blog on my website and mostly just to sort of tell the stories, uh, adventures, and so on, if you will, from my international travels and domestic travels too. Um, so I enjoyed that a lot and wanted to pursue writing some more. So I applied for this Sitka Center residency. And that kind of provided the catalyst for this book, spending four months there um, on the trails, on the beaches, in the estuary, paddling canoes and kayaks. And I also had proposed to Sitka that I would use 
the Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve as the sort of focus and use my consulting skills and uh, approaches like interviewing people, site visits, background ecological research and so on to try to tell the story of the Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve. But in a, a non-academic and a, a creative nonfiction nature writing style. So this book ended up with uh, 15 interconnected essays that try to weave together my personal observations and experiences with uh, ecological science, with historical background, and then also with sort of cross-cultural uh, ecological philosophy and worldviews. And I interviewed about 50 people, more than 50 people during the time I spent there. And you'll, you'll hear about a couple of those later uh, in this presentation. Here's the Sitka Center and it's named after Sitka spruce, which is a common tree in those coastal forests, as you all know, if you live in them. I also wanted to just reflect that uh, for me, spending that much time on the Oregon coast was sort of a homecoming because um, my mother grew up in Portland and I was actually born in Corvallis. But when I was a year old, my father dragged us off to New Mexico where his job took him. So, but almost every summer from New Mexico, we would come back and visit Oregon relatives in Portland. And my granddad would almost always take us for a week to Cannon Beach. So this is Haystack Rock at Cannon Beach. And we, at low tides, go down and poke in the tide pools around the base of Haystack Rock. I especially loved the sea stars or starfish, as some people call them, and the, the multicolored uh, sea stars there. And as, and in, as an adult, I, someone asked me how I became an ecologist. And I think I remember telling them that it was really because of the curiosity and wonder that I had discovered in nature from poking in those tide pools starting at like five years old. And I, I still think that's true. I came back to the Oregon coast to do PhD research on this critter, the black turban snail, uh, we're common in the mid intertidal zone. And I was looking at the behavior <clears throat> and ecology and genetics of this snail because it was a good model for trying to answer the question of whether behavior is ecologically adaptive. What I've come to see in retrospect is that I was really interested in whether human behavior is ecologically adaptive because it seems so often that it isn't ecologically adaptive and wise. But for the snails, it certainly is. They choose habitats where um, they can survive. And I discuss some of that in the book as a kind of ecological or scientific memoir, I guess you'd say, reflecting back on some of my experiences that led me to where I am. Uh, in this talk, I want to just skim through the topics of several essays, one of which is called Voices of the Old Forest. And uh, this is where I became, it, I described where I became familiar with Cape Perpetua Collaborative, and it was through a person that some of you may know and who actually may be on this call, on this webinar. So if Paul's there, I wanna thank him for a wonderful tour of the 10 Mile Creek Sanctuary. Sometime, I guess it was in December of 2018. And the visit there starts this essay called Voices of the Old Forest. Um, the voices that Paul said we should listen to are those of species like the marbled merlet, um, like the northern spotted owl, the red-backed vole, the northern flying squirrel, um, Humboldt's marten. And uh, so 
this talk some about the science of those species as as indicator species of old growth forests in the Northwest. Beautiful big uh, big leaf maple tree along Ten Mile Creek. And Ten Mile Creek itself, some old growth with lots of snags, merlet habitat. This is not my picture of a merlet, but and nor is that, but these little seabirds nest in those old forests, as you all know, I suppose. You may have noticed the illustration at the top of that chapter, the heading of that chapter. Each chapter in this book has a pen and ink illustration by an artist, Nora Sherwood, who lives in Lincoln City. And I wanted to well, I, I reflected on that in this essay called Art and Ecology at the Otis Cafe. Otis is the closest little town to the Sitka Center in Cascade Head, just north of Lincoln City. And since I was at the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, I thought it would be good to look into this relationship between those two things. I've been fascinated by that for a long time. And so, um, here I describe how I first met Nora, which was at a workshop that she was giving on how to draw mushrooms. And uh, here's a poster on the left that she produced of the edible fungi of Lincoln City's open spaces and a couple of the fungi themselves. There are oyster mushrooms and a lobster mushroom on the right. Um, I, I was thinking though that looking at mushrooms or birds or flowers, sort of biological objects, doesn't really communicate their ecological relationships because for a mushroom, for example, that fruiting body is just the tip of the iceberg, if you will, the tip of the mycelium, this giant web of symbiosing hyphae that reach out and interact with all of the, with tree roots all around, for example. So that's very difficult to portray in visual art, at least. Perhaps literary arts would do better. But uh, as a first step, I sent Nora this picture from John James Audubon's Birds of America, which is the black oyster catcher. I know you had a talk recently by Joe Levisite on black oyster catchers and the Portland Audubon's shorebird monitoring of that species. Audubon was an extremely good naturalist and in many of his bird portraits, he showed what the birds ate. So in this case, you see a black oyster catcher jabbing at some limpets at the base of the rock where the other one is standing, <coughs> showing essentially a food chain. Nora immediately came back with something even more interesting which was her portrait of an oyster catcher parent teaching its chick how to eat mussels. And this illustration came about through a collaborative between the Sitka Center, collaboration between the Sitka Center and Portland Audubon and its shorebird monitoring that Nora took part in. But what this shows is not only a food chain, but parents teaching their chicks about that food chain, about what to eat and how to, how to look for food in nature, I guess you'd say. Um, <clears throat> now, there you may, some of you who've been to the Rocky Inner Title probably recognize goose barnacles on the left and on the right, limpets. These are ribbed limpets. So oyster catchers would of course look for the patterns of limpets and they could jab them off and eat them. <clears throat> These arrows point to seven ribbed limpets that are a different color. They're cryptically colored camouflaged to live on the plates of the goose barnacle, hiding from visually hunting predators like oyster catchers. Here in the center, you'll see one of those limpets. And that is the basis of this illustration that Nora did for the heading of that chapter. In the essay, I argue that 
artists and scientists and even oyster catchers pay attention to sensory details, but look for patterns in those details and, and thus sharing a kind of a common perceptual process, sort of oyster catcher science helps them find food. And that's what, at least temporarily, these camouflaged white limpets that hide on goose barnacles have tried to outwit. Another oyster catcher portrait by Nora Sherwood. And she did a lot of artwork for this uh, book a frontispiece, for example, of the southern pinnacle of Cascade Head, which folds across the first couple of pages. Uh, I talk about the biosphere and about biosphere reserves in an essay called Old Orchard and the Biosphere. And this came about when I was out looking at some salt marshes along the Salmon River happened to notice an old orchard and afterwards went over and there were, it was full of apples, even though it hadn't been tended, almost no one picking them. So I uh, ended up picking an apple, cutting it in half, partly just to make sure it was edible and didn't have worms in it. And when I did that, I was really struck by the, how thin the skin was, this delicate red skin around the flesh of the apple, reminded me that that was an analogy that I used in teaching ecology and talking about the biosphere. Because it turns out that the thickness of the biosphere, the little living skin where all of ecology takes place, all of life takes place, is about as thick relative to the earth as the skin of an apple is to the apple. So that thin living skin is where it all happens for us. And the thinness alone kind of implies fragility. It is fragile. Um, biosphere reserves are meant to be places for exploring the relationship between people and nature sort of a laboratory and a model, if there's some lessons there. And Cascade Head is Oregon's only biosphere reserve at present. Here's a plaque uh, that was made for its designation in 1976. It was one of the first biosphere reserves in the US. Here is a Nora sketch map, sort of another eagle-eyed view of the Biosphere Reserve showing key points that are mentioned in the book, key places. Um, biosphere Reserves are, were set up by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, and uh, called the Man and the Biosphere Program. That's a name that's quite uh, what dated and everyone recognizes these days and I think UNESCO is probably in the process of changing that to humans in the biosphere program. There are around 700, it's a growing list of biosphere reserves in 124 countries now. The US has 28 of those, one of which is Cascade Head and there are five others on the Pacific coast of, or four others on the Pacific coast of the US. Um, shifting topics just a little here. This book uh, is really categorized, I think, as creative nonfiction nature writing. And nature writing is almost always place based, that is grounded in a particular place or ecosystem. So if you think, for example, of Thoreau's Walden or John Muir's My First Summer in the Sierra or Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, or Robert Michael Pyle's Winter Green. Those are all focused on particular places. But a valid question, I think, is how big is your place? Because it's very difficult, really impossible ecologically, to draw boundaries around ecosystems. And place-based writing is appealing because it can be lyrical and it can 
show readers the complex uh, particulars of nature in a certain place, but where are the boundaries? Um, really, when you probe for the ecological boundaries of any place, they expand outward and around you know, the sphere of the biosphere. So any place on earth is linked really with the entire biosphere. And for example, at Cascade Head or Cape Perpetua, salmon and gray whales, for example, have stories that expand our ecological horizons. And they illustrate what I called in the book, uh, prescription for correcting the ecological myopia, nearsightedness of our own species. A place I often stopped when I was going between the Sitka Center and uh, Newport, the Hatfield Marine Science Center, was Rocky Creek to look for gray whales. And one day I saw some feeding just beyond the foam line. Here's this uh, image from my little notebook. Um, I sometimes would get good views of them fluking when they, you know, their flukes when they would dive to feed. And one that was especially striking was this one that I call paint, paint drops because it had these white stripes on its black flukes. Here's how Nora rendered that for the beginning of a, an illustration for a chapter called Whale Haven. And uh, this is about gray whales. For this essay, I started with an epigraph in Spanish and translated later by the Mexican poet Homero Aridges, y Dios creó las grandes ballenas allá en Laguna San Ignacio. So God created the great whales there in the San Ignacio Lagoon. Here is the San Ignacio Lagoon, an amazing place now. This is a, one of the lagoons on the western side of the Baja Peninsula where all of the Eastern Pacific gray whales go to breed and to calve. And whales there have become habituated to humans in boats and come up very close to sort of say hello. I know you heard a talk about gray whale migration recently too through this Cape Perpetual Collaborative Speaker Series, but it's really quite amazing to be able to see these creatures up close even touch them if they let you and come close enough. Um, but these breeding lagoons are in another biosphere reserve, the El Vizcaino Biosphere Reserve, which is right about here, central Baja. This is the San Ignacio Lagoon, if you can see my pointer. The El Vizcaino Biosphere Reserve was established in 1988 with an area of uh, nearly 10,000 square miles. And Cascade Head, you can see just for comparison, is 160 square miles. Most of the terrestrial area of the El Vizcaino Biosphere Reserve is desert, more or less Sonoran desert with giant cacti. Here it is, and again, the San Ignacio Lagoon here. Uh, this, this is another major breeding lagoon for gray whales. So this is essentially, you might say, a sister biosphere reserve of uh, Cascade Head because it shares whales. And back to um, Cascade Head again for, for just a moment. The lessons that I took from the time I spent there are basically three. One of which is that the actions and efforts of individuals can make a big difference in the human nature relationship in a place. Whether reaching back to Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, who helped to create the national forest that Cascade Head is in, or that Cape Perpetua is surrounded by, to uh, scientific researchers and artists who have helped promote the conservation of that place. And another point is that ecological mysteries are still everywhere. Despite all the research and all the knowledge we've gained, 
there's there's way more to learn than we know, and that research is needed to inform sustainable ecological management. So it's a never ending task, always will be needed. And finally, how we think about our place in nature, uh, which I call our worldviews, are extremely important in shaping how we behave, how we interact with the environment, both individually and collectively, societally. Sometimes those worldviews lead to positive uh, interactions, sustainable, resilient interactions with nature and others. No, other times negative, destructive interactions that are not sustainable or resilient. So this has been something that's fascinated me for a long time, this issue of worldviews and especially thinking about non-Western, non-European worldviews. And so I, in a couple of essays, I reflect on uh, comparative, essentially, worldviews and ecological philosophy. In one essay called Dancing on the Shortest Day, I talk a bit about um, Native American worldviews related to the environment and um, this was inspired partly by being invited to the winter solstice dance at Solets in December of 2018, the Nedosh ceremony there, which was extremely striking and powerful for me, having grown up in New Mexico, where I also saw a lot of Native American dances in the Pueblos in the Rio Grande Valley. I think uh, understanding and perhaps even restoring some of the worldviews of the people who lived there for so long before Europeans came could help us uh, create more resilient lifestyles in the future. Now, I wanna end and tease you with a little thought here. And I do hope I'm saving enough time for some questions because that will be interesting to me. Uh, again, Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve was established in 1976 and is pretty small, uh, 160 square miles. Here's a map of it. It goes between basically Lincoln City and Mescaline, encompassing uh, Sayuslaw National Forest lands, including the Cascade Head Experimental Forest and the Nesco and Crest Research Natural Area. Uh, it includes a Nature Conservancy Preserve and the Cascade Head Marine Reserve. So even in this tiny place, the stakeholders are complex. The land ownership and management is very complex. Here is the Clayoquot Region Biosphere Reserve. Are you all seeing this okay? I don't know if Tara can tell me. I'm yes. getting, okay. The Clayoquot Biosphere Region in Canada, which I visited, this is on the west coast of Vancouver Island, central Vancouver Island, established in 2000, and it's 1,351 square miles. So again, you'll see it's almost eight or nine times as big as Cascade Head. Significant Native American presence there. And uh, again, extremely complicated stakeholder picture at Clayoquot Sound. A researcher, Jim Darling there, has done a tremendous amount of work on um, summer resident gray whales, which spend some, some whales spend, some, spend all summer there, just like they do off of the Oregon coast, the central Oregon coast. So again, that's linked, one of our, uh, Cascade Head's sister biosphere reserves, you might say, because of whales. The Golden Gate Biosphere Reserve in California was established in 1988, and it has an area of 28,000 square miles. This is the Point Reyes Lighthouse. And part of the reason it's so large is that it has some gigantic um, national marine sanctuaries, Cordell Bank and uh, the Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuaries, the Farallons National Wildlife Refuge, 
uh, Point Reyes National Seashore. It has state lands, federal lands, uh, other lands, and it's gigantic and complex and doing amazing things as far as collaboration among all those stakeholders. So, and that's the closest one to the South. That's truly a sister of Cascade Head. Now, here's what I wanted to tease you with. What about the future Oregon Coast Biosphere Reserve, which could be established in who knows when? Uh, taking in the Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve, tiny, and also that basically the map that uh, Tara showed at the beginning with the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve, Cape Perpetua Scenic Area, uh, various wilderness areas, Forest Service wilderness areas, the Ten Mile Creek Sanctuary, and so on. Now that may seem like a big chunk of territory, but the distance between Florence and Tillamook is about 100 miles, that, that red line on the left. And the distance between Point Arena and Santa Cruz, California, which basically spans the Golden Gate Biosphere Reserve is 165 miles. So if there were an Oregon Coast Biosphere Reserve, it would be smaller than the Golden Gate Biosphere Reserve. So I just wanted to tease you all with that idea before I, before I wrap up here and uh, if anyone would ever like to get in touch with me, please send me a note. My email and my website are here. And with that, I want to turn it back over to our facilitator, Tara, and maybe there'll be some questions here. If I could figure it out, I could try my video. <laughs> still flickering so <laughs> I don't thank know thank you for thank you for that you. presentation Bruce uh, so anybody if you have any questions please feel free to add them to the Q&A section for Bruce um, and Bruce I will kick off a question um, while we're waiting for some to come in I always like to ask um, was there a special moment or an aha like what really inspired you to kind of go down the road and do more research in ecology and biospheres? Let's see. Well, the, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I think my, my love of nature and my fascination with things ecological goes way back to poking in tide pools, you know, to very early childhood experiences of being out in nature. And I think that did lead me to become an ecologist Somehow also though, and maybe this was from living in a very multicultural uh, part of the US, Northern New Mexico, I also became interested in uh, human, you know, the human sciences and, and the humanities. And so um, as an undergraduate, my major was actually human ecology and I could never quite decide what I liked best. And I became, uh, you know, I sort of have tried to split the difference. And in, a, in, in my career, my consulting work, basically that's what you have to do is try to bridge the gap between social sciences and natural sciences for an understanding of what sustainable human development might mean. Absolutely. And then we did get some questions rolling in. First one is where can you, your book be purchased? Uh, let's see, the, um, the Oregon State Press website, if you just search for the title of the book, you can order it straight through Oregon State University Press. I am hoping that local bookstores up and down the coast carry it, so I don't know where that person is asking from, but uh, any place up and down the coast, if there's a local bookstore there or even inland in Oregon, I'm hoping that they will be stocking this book. Perfect. And for everybody, I just did include a link to that as well in the chat if you're interested. Uh, what is the process of establishing a new biosphere reserve? It looks like Nora's asking that question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
I, I am not sure the exact steps you would have to go through. There is a process of, um, of uh, you know, nominating a place as a biosphere reserve to the UNESCO program, to the Humans in the Biosphere program. If there's already an established biosphere reserve, in many cases that can be expanded um, by work through collaboration and by collaborative work with partners in that biosphere reserve. Another huge and amazing, well, two others that I might mention uh, in the US, the Southern Appalachians Biosphere Reserve, if you search for that, you'll see that it's an immense patch of, yeah, the Southern Appalachians. The Adirondack and Lake Champlain Biosphere Reserve in New York and Vermont is also a large area, lots of stakeholders. So, you know, I and actually every 10 years, each biosphere reserve has to do a periodic review, it's called, for the UNESCO program. That would be the point at which uh, people could propose expanding an existing biosphere reserve. Nice. And then I'm not sure, oh, real quick here, uh, Paul Robertson, the coordinator for uh, Cascade Head Biosphere says, you can also purchase the book at Bob's Beach Books. Um, so that is also another location I'm guessing is more local too. Um, and what, if you know anything on sea star wasting syndrome, we've got a question here. What's the latest info on sea star wasting syndrome? Has the cause been identified? Are sea stars making a comeback? And what were the impacts to other species of sea stars decline. Um, so I'm not sure if you know uh, too much about this, Bruce, um, but just in case, yeah. um, I wanna mention, we do have a video available on sea stars from a graduate student that answers quite a few of these questions. Um, but Bruce, do you have any experience with it? Yeah, that was a course, especially because of my, <laughs> love of sea stars. Uh, yeah. That one is, is actually called the ochre sea star. The mm -hmm. Pisasterocratius is that very, very common one that's found in the mussel beds. And because of my love of that critter, I of course knew I would have to research this. Uh, <laughs> for the book, there's an essay in the book called Where Have All the Sea Stars Gone? And so that talks all about sea star, well, especially the ochre sea stars ecology, something about how that links with my research because um, one of my PhD research sites was at Macaw Bay on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington, which is where the whole idea of a keystone species was developed by someone who studied that sea star. I did interact and, and talk to a lot of people at Oregon State who are, have been monitoring this. So I suggest you get the book and read the chapter on where have all the sea stars come <laughs> The cause is still not really known yeah. perfectly. And, be, and so it's not been called, it's now called sea star wasting syndrome because it's not quite clear. There may be a virus involved, a pandemic of sea star virus, but it, that doesn't fit all the evidence. So it's an interesting, again, ecological mystery. Mm-hmm, definitely. Um, what would be your counsel regarding the first steps in exploring the potential of an Oregon Biosphere Reserve? Uh, exploring the potential. I think the Cape Perpetua Collaborative should host a meeting with the <laughs> folks at Cascade Head and bring in federal and state and local and NGO partners, you know, Portland Audubon, the Nature Conservancy, the State Marine Reserves, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, et cetera. You know, if, if enough people are interested and you all have at the, at the Cape Perpetual Collaborative, I, I'm thinking you're quite skillful at collaboration or at least you're getting more skillful at it. Uh, that is truly needed at Cascade Head too, to, to bring stakeholders together and, and get them thinking about, well, why would a biosphere reserve be a useful model for us? So that would be a first step I would think of. 
Oh, there's always got to start with the first step. Getting started is half the battle, huh? <laughs> <laughs> And then Paul mentions here, he says, great job. And he likes the idea of linking the uh, Cape Perpetual land sea conservation efforts to the Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve. And also to include um, these efforts in the Hasita Head uh, Perpetual Stonewall Banks um, that are offshore here. Um, and that he's looking forward to crossing paths. Um, did you speak or interview anyone associated with the Cascade Head Experimental Forest? Yeah, and uh, Bill Robbins, of course, uh, I recognize the name, has a wonderful book, uh, very detailed historical book about the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest, which is one of the most amazing research sites in the country a book that just came out same time mine did from Oregon State University Press. Um, yeah, I, I spoke with a lot of people who had been involved with the Cascade Head Experimental Forest and the designation of the Nesquen Crest Research Natural Area. I dug in some old archives going back into the 1940s to find out about that spoke with the well-known and famous uh, forest scientist Jerry Franklin about that, um, and a number of other people who worked there for most of their whole careers. So that would make an interesting story, Bill, if you want to try to tell it, and I'd be <laughs> glad to talk to you more about that. As a young person growing up, how did you become the writer you are today? Well, let's see. I somehow always have enjoyed reading and, and reading about nature and have appreciated the, the literary style of nature writing, I guess. You know, I'm a scientist too, but for me, a lot of the what uh, emotion and, and interest in, in writing comes from the, yeah, the emotional side or the philosophical side or the historical side. So uh, for me, it was just stumbling forward, trying to do my own writing and to make stories about my consulting interesting to readers on my blog. And uh, so I guess I feel like I'm becoming a writer, but uh, I still would like to learn more. And there are plenty of good authors out there to read too. It's, it's a very rich literature if you're interested in creative nonfiction nature writing, of course. Blogs are always a great way to start. Um, all right, we have a question here from Brian Cohen. Uh, he was wondering what the main challenges are in the upkeep of, a, of biosphere reserves, that is sustaining the reserves ecosystem services values while allowing people to engage with them. Question. Biosphere, biosphere reserves, yeah, I think have different functions and different benefits in different parts of the world. So I've worked in 34 of them in 17 different countries and as a model for how to bring sustainable development together with ecological, yeah, ecological bio, biodiversity conservation and eco, ecological conservation. They work differently in different settings. In very poor developing countries, um, sometimes they can act as a sort of a clearinghouse for stakeholders and a source of uh, reaching out for international donors to support work in those developing countries. Europe is packed full of biosphere reserves and <clears throat> there they have their own, I think, reasons for being sometimes very what, administrative. In the US, uh, it's still a struggle. We once had 47 biosphere reserves and a whole bunch of them were canceled early in the uh, last almost past administration. We only have 28 left now. And I'm, we're searching, I think. You could talk to people at these different US biosphere reserves and I think we're all searching for how to make these relevant in the context of our modern challenges of sustainable human development and a human nature relationship, climate change and everything else. So I think it's still an ongoing experiment and 
Cascade Head and the new Oregon Coast Biosphere Reserve can help push that forward, perhaps. And do you know, would the fishing industry be opposed to extending the biosphere? No, of course, I don't know that. Um, the, I'm not sure, for example, well, let's see. Two things to mention, I guess, would be that uh, one of the, the, the Golden Gate Biosphere Reserve, they're working with uh, NOAA, you know, which also is involved in fisheries management. I don't know what they've worked out for those giant areas of national marine sanctuaries and uh, Farallon National Wildlife Refuge as far as fishing goes. There's also just south of the next Biosphere Reserve south is the Channel Islands off of Santa Barbara, California. So again, uh, fisheries issues there. Any coastal Biosphere Reserve would have to be involved with the uh, fishing industry as stakeholders. Yeah, definitely. Definitely would want to include them in the conversation. Uh, what can interested individual do? What can an interested individual do to help further further this great idea? <clears throat> Um, if the great idea means an Oregon Coast Biosphere Reserve, again, I think just start learning about biosphere reserves and start thinking about how to bring about collaboration and public engagement. In, in Oregon, both of these areas have the Forest Service as the dominant land management agency behind them. And so in Cascade Head, for example, most of the area of the Biosphere Reserve, well, not most, but a large part of it is Hebo Ranger District, Sayusla National Forest. So starting, you know, if the public can start engaging, if the uh, agencies can start engaging with public groups, that's the way to start. And any observations on the influence of climate change in your work as an ecologist, especially at Cascade Head? Interesting question again. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that. The Nesco and Crest Research Natural Area has a series of uh, something like 40 <clears throat> quite remote long-term forest monitoring plots that were set up by Jerry Franklin and his team back in the 1970s, late 1970s, I think, 1979. They've been measuring trees and counting trees in those plots about every five years since then. So it's a fairly long-term record of how forests are responding to climate. And if there is gonna be some understanding of how climate change might affect for us like at Cascade Head, it would be through those, through research on those monitoring plots. Those forests often up on the high uh, elevations, they're like Cape Perpetual would be in many cases sort of fog drinking forests, I think of them. A, a large part of the precipitation may come from fog drip. And that's where if the climate warms very much, that fog drip may slow way down. So that would be a place to look. Uh, Climate change, of course, is influencing ocean issues too and fisheries. Um, there's a, there's several chapters, several essays in the book that deal with salmon and salmon conservation. So water temperatures, ocean acidification, and all those things are affecting, linked to climate change are affecting marine and terrestrial ecosystems. It really is amazing how it's all connected. Um, and it looks here, so we're out of questions. I'm gonna go through the chat here real quick. It looks here like you can also purchase the book is available at powells.com and at Barnes and Noble. Um, and then we have a uh, thank you here from Maria. She's an Arizona, she's Arizona and New Mexico desert rat and loves your sea stars uh, that she found walking on the beach. Um, let's see here. And I think that covers all of our questions. Oh, and then we have someone here that says, why couldn't we stretch it down to Coos Bay? <laughs> I would love that too. If you all want to, if you all want to do that, my main re one of my main research sites for my PhD thesis was uh, Cape Arago, 
So okay. that's a place that I love. And there's been some really key research on black oyster catchers and limpets at Cape Arago, including the study about their habitat choice that I showed you a couple pictures from. That was my study from the late 80s. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my video. <laughs> oh, like and then we have one more um, before we leave off. They're wondering if you can show the book cover again. Yeah, let's see how I can do that. There you go, the view from the Cascade Head. And with that, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you getting online with us. And thank you to everybody attending. Uh, this will be available uh, for a recording for future playback for sharing. Um, and with that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the book if you get it um, and enjoy your adventures outside. It looks like we have, well, at least here in Walport, Oregon, we've got sun this morning. So smiles on my face. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you again, Bruce. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.